Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Business from the Bass Boat on the Serious Angler Network. And guys, today I am excited. We've got an incredible show lined up, but without further ado, I do need to mention uh, a couple of things here. Bailey and Andrew on the Serious Angler crew, they will be at Redcrest here in the month of March. I will be at the Classic with Bailey, so come, come find us. We might have some some giveaways and some prizes. We will be around the X2 booth. We will be around um, a bunch of booths just at the Classic and at Redcrest. So spend some time. Come say hello. We will certainly be walking around and uh, don't be a stranger. So just wanted to get that out of the way. Also wanted to point out a new sponsor to the show, Rec Lending. Guys, this has a, a been a great one just for the business from the Bass Boat platform, as well as just the Serious Angler platform in general. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around lending in the bass boat community. And uh, there's a lot of questions I think folks have on what makes sense. And rec lending is a great resource when it comes to both the loans and warranties on bass boats. I mean, we're talking about spending quite a bit of money on these boats and um, there's, there's a lot of good resources out there. So expect a lot of content from us from that standpoint going forward. Um, and we'll get some, some questions answered around that, but Great time to announce a new sponsor like that because we have got an awesome show lined up today. Innovation, I think, is something that is is going to continue to happen in our space. And I, I love being on trying to get as many interviews on the forefront of stuff coming out. And we've got a great show lined up today with Lurion Boats. And I hope I said that correctly. But uh, we've got the founders uh, of this brand, and I can't wait to break down this boat. Big bass boat fanatic, as you guys know. And without further ado, let's bring in Cameron and Kobe. How's it going, guys? Good. We're How doing great. Doing? Yeah. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a little bit jealous of your guys' weather. It sounds like uh, you're a little further south than I am in the the Georgia area and uh, you guys have some incredible spotted bass lakes around you on Lanier and all kinds of stuff. Fortunately we do. Yeah. Yeah. I think Kobe went fishing today. He told me, uh, uh, how many fish you get today? 29, 29 fish today. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of fish around. It was also like, I think 80 degrees uh, oh my. Today here. So wow. it was pretty crazy. <laughs> Ellis, Colby, how, how are you catching them today? Today, it was just mostly um, Ned rigs and shaky heads. Just okay. Little stuff. Catching, catching, what were you on Lanier or some, one of those surrounding reservoirs? Um, I was actually just in a pond today. Okay. I wasn't able to get out onto a uh, main lake today. He gotcha. did have school. Uh, he was supposed to, when I left to, to go to work, for work, he was at school. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> That's good to hear. That's good to hear. That's awesome. Well, um, guys, I've just been doing some research on, on lure on boats and, and everything with the launch. It seems like, uh, you know, a lot of buzz around it and just being, I think it's so innovative, uh, something that really hasn't, uh, been, been, uh, seen in the marketplace at all and the design and everything that you guys have going. And, um, man, I just want to start kind of at the beginning. Where did, where did the concept for you guys, start and and what what made you want to jump into this so i think the main concept of it was when wait whenever i had fishing tournaments for high school we'd mm -hmm. look at all the boats and really there isn't many differences between these boats besides like simple stuff like seating arrangement or how stuff's set up what what goes where tack boxes um etc and we and i had this and me and my dad were t got to talking and decided that um something needed to actually change and also that um a better bass boat was possible yeah no i yeah. like that i you, i think you're you're dead on from the standpoint that uh boats are i mean really it's it's a hole right when we're talking bass boats it's a hole it's a motor Yes, everyone has different electronics. You know, there's different fit and finish and qualities when it comes to Perfect. boats, but uh, they're fairly similar when it gets down, you know, down to it. Yeah. And then the other thing that that um, really sort of drove this, as as Colby and I were talking about it and fishing and and stuff, was um, you know, 
bass boats today are all, it's all about fishing off, off the bow of the boat, right? Um, uh, that's where your trolling motor is. That's where, you know, people are stacking their, their displays and chart plotters and stuff at. Um, but the back of the boat between bigger outboards, power poles, it's sort of a no fishing zone, really. Like, right. and which for high school is a big problem because we have two man teams. So, me, I usually run the trolling motor. And for my partner sitting in the back, he broke this season alone three of his rods on. Oh, no. Catching, yeah. catching yeah. poles. Yeah. Catching poles. Yeah. And so, like, I think for us, it was um, this whole thing came about to make a boat more fish fishable, right? Like, how do you catch more fish? Like, that's why we're doing this is try and make like a 360 degree platform where you can cast anywhere around the boat. You can, you know, put your uh, sonar transponders, you know, both at the, at the bow of the trolling motor uh, as well as off the stern and truly catch fish anywhere. Um, and then I think the other thing for me was, um, you know, Colby's the oldest of, of my kids. I have four kids. Um, so we're a big family. Uh, and best boats aren't designed for like families really yeah. at all. It's really like a two person thing and maybe three at a squeeze. Um, but four is not really practical. And so I think as we started trying to like, how do we squeeze all these things in, into the same boat, right? How do you make, how do you not compromise on fishing, not compromise on performance and try and bring like four people uh, out fishing instead of two. Um, and so that's sort of how we got, that was sort of the brief that we had and we sort of started sketching it out. And then, um, you know, then sort of one sort of idea led to another, led to another, led to another. Um, and, and yeah. And, and then you get Lurian uh, boats and uh, and uh, Ion Twenty One is the sort of first of those, um, and it, it definitely looks a little bit different. <laughs> it's powered a little bit differently, um, and is you know uh, I think changing changing quite a few things in the space. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think uh, what we'll do in a second here is pull it up on the screen for folks watching on YouTube to be able to kind of really break this thing down. I'll try to do my best on the podcast side, guys, of, of going through what we're talking about, but super innovative and futuristic looking and, you know, something that uh, doesn't look the same as all the bass boats that we're talking about for sure. Um, and uh I like I like a lot of a lot of the concepts and and just I, I think the biggest thing to me uh, that I, I am excited for is just whenever there's something that this different and innovative it just pushes the industry right and you see you see growth from all all sides of things and so um, kudos to you guys to stepping up and doing it right because it's a lot easier to kind of just do the same thing. Yeah, well, I think, we, and we talked about that a lot, right? Like we talked a lot about together, do we, you know, do we buy something and modify it a lot right. and right. and go that path? Do we do something brand brand new? And I think there's probably a good a time as any to say like, um, I think we want to be super humble about, about what we're trying to do here. Um, I mean, the, the big, the big bass boat brands are amazing like um, between Skeeter and Phoenix and Ranger and oh, Bass Cat, and, you know, Bullet, you name it, keep going down the list. They've all done incredibly awesome things for the sport. Um, mm -hmm. And we are riding on their coattails, I would say. And um, we're just trying to turn it like another crank, uh, if you like. Um, and I think for us, some of the things that we're doing are, are trying to tackle like constraints that are in place, um, but doing it in a totally different way than other people have thought about it, if that makes sense. And so whether that's um, how we power the boat, right? Like on tournament days and, and at Colby's tournaments, you know, 250 horsepower is the maximum. Um, right. And so, you know, instead of like building a boat that's powered at 250 horsepower, we basically have designed a, a drivetrain that we detune for tournament days mm. to 250 horsepower. Mm. So it's 
it le has less performance for high school uh, angling tournament days. Right. Um, but on Sunday, if you want to go out and just blow by everybody on the lake um, at crazy speed, uh, you will. You will. Right. <laughs> Right, um, and, and that's so just. You get into that, but I think it's it's just thinking about it sort of in in sort of like different ways, uh, maybe than some of the other guys have done, but but not necessarily better. And some parts of it we think are better. Some parts of it, you know, we we've still got to learn different. and and grow. But um, yeah, we're super excited about it. Awesome, awesome. That's great to hear. And and um, you know, with with your background, Cameron, what kind of uh, you know, is this, do you have experience in building boats? What, where, where did this, I mean, it sounds like an incredible concept, but what are you bringing from your background into this game and, and how is this all kind of coming together? If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. So, um, well, neither, neither Colby or I are boat builders by background. Uh, we're also not like naval architects. Um, uh, I would say this is Colby's the, so the, the, uh, sort of came up with a vision for, for the boat. Um, uh -huh. And he and I together sort of like sketched it out in your sort of classic startup way on a, on a, on a napkin at Love dinner it. one night. Right. Um, not not and, quite at the bar, uh, but, but at dinner. Yeah, not at the bar, not quite yet at the bar. <laughs> not quite yet. Uh, yeah, better not be quite yet, actually. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think then we basically, we spent about a year and a half on this. Um, okay. We worked with a, a naval architecture uh company uh, out of florida called uh, ocean five um, okay they do a lot of the design work for you know some of the biggest offshore um uh fishing uh boats uh, wow. and leisure craft like like companies like sea ray and uh and and big big sort of uh marine uh fishing offshore fishing boats yeah and i think a number of the things that we're actually bringing to bear um to the lurian come from the offshore um, powerboat racing and offshore catamaran and offshore sort of fishing boat world to the freshwater bass sort of you community. Downsized. Yeah, we just sort of shrunk some of that uh, down here um, with, with Lurian. And so, yeah, we've been, we've been working with them for about a year and a half on designs and iterating and and, and overcoming uh, different challenges. Um, and there's a company in North Carolina, Symmetrics, that builds most of the molds and, and cool. things for most of the boat manufacturers. Mm. Sort of big companies, they're one of the two. They've been helping us on our um, molds and, and everything else to uh, get things sort of set up uh, and going. Um, and yeah, so the, the, uh, sort of the two big companies that have been, been helping us so far uh, on this. Um, to sort of bring it all all together. Nice, yeah. It, uh, it. I'll basically pull it up here for folks on YouTube to design sure. and start asking some questions. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. So, so I mean, super futuristic looking, just awesome looking bass. But I think the things uh, that stand out to me right away, right, is obviously not having an outboard on the back and having having that. Uh, that big distinction off of the, off of the back. Let's first, I guess, go into the, the drivetrain and, you know, I mean, you're looking at it, it looks like a propeller with, with five blades on it, not your traditional, you know, three or four bay floor blade prop yeah. uh, on a, on an outboard, but what is the, the thought process behind everything there and, and the motor being completely electric? Yeah. So I think the, the first thing to call out on this is the reason it's electric is because we want to catch more fish and and that was the best way to drive the performance we wanted sort of out of the boat and to have sort of no compromises mm -hmm. um, and so the the drive train itself comes from offshore powerboat racing it's a okay. surface drive uh unit so it's designed um to run with half the propeller in the water and half the propeller out of the water so right. it essentially has like a water tunnel that is in the hull of the boat that's that's bringing sort of clean water uh, to the propeller. Um, but only half the propeller sits in the water, um, other half sits above. That type of drivetrain is about 30% more efficient than outboard uh, drivetrain in terms of 
how much resistance, et cetera, is in, in the, uh, sitting in the water. So in a, you know, in a two boat hulls, exactly the same apples to apples sort of comparison, uh, surface drive is about 30% more efficient than a uh, outboard drive. So that was, that was the reason for this sort of drivetrain choice. So that by itself gives you a massive advantage in terms of performance. Um, then I think the other big part of the drivetrain is it's, it's probably the simplest drivetrain you could have, which really appealed to us having had multiple boats of different types and kinds from, from a maintenance point of view, from a reliability point of view, um, simpler is just better. Um, and this has like literally five moving parts. Um, wow. Right. Um, and so it's like ultra simple. Um, and so, you know, it's basically a battery running, you know, high voltage uh, and low voltage, both um, through an in inverter to an electric uh, motor. Um, and then that motor is connected directly to the uh, uh, drive shaft um, mm -hmm. with the propeller on it. Right. So super, super simple. And that's got a rudder um, that's sort of hydraulically controlled. So um, it couldn't, it sort of couldn't be more simple um, in that, in that regard. Uh, I think the other big thing about electric versus any other drivetrain option mm -hmm. is you get all the power instantly, right? It's, right. it's more like the oh. light switch, like a binary uh, light switch type approach. And so, um, we're basically connected up through a hot, hot foot throttle. Um, uh, so a super familiar sort of driving, you know, controls experience for, for bass boat anglers. Um, I think the thing that won't be familiar to them is uh, how much torque and speed you get instantaneously. <laughs> right. Like, like you crazy. You're immediately on plane. Yeah. I, I think there's a bunch of things without getting into too many of the details of it for everyone, but like, it's also about weight. Um, so the batteries are actually reasonably heavy, mm -hmm. but, but, but so is fuel. Um, but the batteries are, are placed exactly where we want the weight in the boat. Um, right. So right. it's not, it's not sitting and hanging off the back. It's sitting in the V of the boat, exactly where we want the weight to be. Um, and the weight never changes with the batteries. So, no matter how, even if they're, you know, near empty, they still weigh the same. Um, and so your, your performance handling characteristics and, and stability and everything else that comes from that way um, remains the same in all conditions. Consistent. No, matter, yeah. no matter how much is going. And it also changes like, you know, as you're familiar with when you, when you put your throttle down from, you know, you know, you're sitting idling, you put your throttle down, you, you raise up, you trim up, and then you're trimming down to get on plane. Um, your bow comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your bow comes up. That doesn't happen really with this. This is much more like um, it, it basically just pops up and is on plane pretty much instantly because the weight's exactly where you want it. It does have trim tabs. The trim tabs aren't unfortunately in the, in the um, 3D renderings, but it's got trim tabs built in at the back. So you can, just like you do on any other bass boat, you can trim the, the, um, the angle of attack up and down and, and, and things like that, but um, for different sea conditions um, and, and chop, what have you. But right. it's, um, it's quite a different sort of handling experience. And then the last thing I guess I would say on that is it's a stepped hull as well. So the, which comes again from offshore powerboat racing um, and it's something that's come to the offshore fishing boat fleets with catamarans and various other things a lot. And so the, the CVs, CVs yeah. et cetera, like, you know, um, and so I think there again, the hull is more efficient. Water is actually aerated coming through against the hull, but then as um, the tunnel of the hull has clean water for the, for the drivetrain. So that was a super long answer, uh, Adam, but hopefully that helps. No, that, that, that does. I think I know what you're talking about there. There's, there's just, there's a gap right underneath, underneath exactly. to where the, the tunnel. So, and that, that brings up an interesting point. Um, cause to me, that was my first thought looking at the, the motor was, uh, this is similar to a tunnel hole, um, yeah. standpoint, right. Which is, you know, for a while, 
in the bass fishing world, um, actually, you know, guys were using it on river systems to be able to get super shallow because you can draft that boat so shallow and that kind of a thing. But then they were, some of that stuff was banned from tournaments. Uh, and they said, you need to have a motor all the way in the water. Um, you can't have a hole that has a tunnel hole or th there was an open, I think a couple of years ago that, that basically a guy was, uh, able to get into super shallow water, jump and stuff and, and that kind of a thing. Um, so, uh, it, it's, it's similar to that standpoint because you're right without, with your prop out of the water, I mean, you're getting so much less resistance. I mean, you, you, from that, that motor spinning and, um, yeah. And I'm curious. So, so is this similar, this prop design mm -hmm. where you're getting half the prop out of the water or whatever, whatever it is, is that what you're saying in these? And I'm not familiar at all with offshore boats and that kind of a thing. Is that the yeah. similar design to where it's up high like that? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, they're all designed. So the waterline of the boat, you know, with fully loaded weight, essentially is designed for the, um, half the propeller to be in the water, uh, mm. at plane and half of it to be out of the water. And then I, I think, think the, the other consequence of that, um, is waves, which is like, it puts out like the crazy roof detail out the back of the right. boat, like. <laughs> 30 feet high going down the lake. So it's like, wow. um, you know, for those, for those of you that want everyone to see you, they're going to see you when you fly down the lake at, at, in this boat. Cause, uh, it puts out a pretty massive, uh, rooster tail out the back. Well, that's, I mean, uh, I, that just makes me think immediately, right. Of, um, I fished a tournament earlier this year down on, on Lake Havasu in Arizona, and it's just known yeah. for, you know, cigarette boats and big, big boats with two four hundreds on them just ripping ripping down the lake right doing 120 miles an hour and having that big rooster tail and and you know i i've always it's fun i mean to trim up even on in a in a traditional bass boat to have that rooster tail at times it's fun yeah 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 so this will do that naturally in its most efficient trim form it does that naturally um Got so it. uh that's a, a fun byproduct of this of this but it's also why the the boat is um, able to make sort of the performance claims it can make because it, it is driven this way with all these pieces together. Right. Okay. And, and then trim tabs too, uh, interesting thing to add into the bass boat world. And I, and I like that, um, you know, I, and I'm curious too, just, I'm thinking about anytime I've been in rough water and, and thinking about this boat, obviously length being 23 feet long, uh, yeah. that's already two feet longer than, than a traditional, you know, 21 foot boat. So, I'm thinking great lakes. And I mean, we've, we've talked so much in this industry about how bass boats aren't really made to be on great lakes and anything over really two and a half, three foot, four foot waves. It's not fun. I mean, we all do it in those tournament situations, but it's not, it's not enjoyable, uh, from, from, and any boat, I don't care what boat you're in. Um, and, uh, no, I'm, I'm curious to see, like you're saying the ride differences and with where the prop is, you know, in, in my head, I'm, I'm trimmed down. I'm trying to lock that boat down to not have it jump and come out of the water. Um, and then to, to add trim tabs into this whole thing, I think there's one, the only boat that I'm aware of in the bass boat world, I think a gambler, you know, small niche yeah. boat company out of Florida, they can come with trim tabs. And I've heard KJ queen on the elite series, talk about it on, on, in rough water. But yeah. I mean, how does explain that, I guess, for, for the average freshwater bass fisherman, what do trim tabs do in, in, in that kind of a standpoint? Yeah, so I think essentially what, what they do is, is um, you know, if uh, you put my hand here, essentially what they're doing is, is, is they're basically, you know, they're creating a resistance. So if, if your hull, hull's here, um, the tab goes down, that's going to point your nose down, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so it overcomes this motion of rearing up. Um, but sometimes, to your point, on the Great Lakes, if you're in two or four, three foot chop, you actually want your bow to be up, right? Um, but you still want to be on plane, but with your bow up, so that the water's breaking out to the side of you, not all over your your deck, right? Um, and so uh, it lets you have more control. Um, it also acts in many ways. Uh, at, at, for a surface drive like this, it acts almost like a jack plate does for the outboard. Mm. Um, and so small changes in your trim tabs uh, change your sort of angle of, of uh, your bow uh, up and down 
against the water um, and can improve your your performance um, uh, you know over the water and so it, it'll it'll be a little bit of an adjustment but then unlike most of the offshore boats have them hanging off the back of the boat right they're kind of right on the edge right yeah these, these are actually built in under the under the boat so when they're oh. closed all the way up it's just completely smooth hull mm -hmm. um and then they lower down to give you uh, uh additional control capabilities interesting wow yeah it, that that's uh kind of groundbreaking stuff i think in the in the bass boat market in itself with yeah. a lot of this and uh, i'm curious to see just like you're saying that ride difference and um, that learning curve, right. For, for guys driving these boats, if they're from a traditional bass boat and, and, uh, in those rough water situations and, and that kind of a thing. I think they'll just find, I think what most people will find is because of the weight and where the weight is. And then the, also the extra length and width versus a 21 foot boat, right. um, they'll feel like they're on like a, you know, like a high sided sort of center console almost comparatively I, right um interesting and so the it's actually super simple to drive it's not like a learning curve on it um uh and it increases your confidence and keeps you drier <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh in that regard i think i think you know it's like everything about about trimming boats though experience does play a role um over time and you know, you go from one boat to another, even the same model with a different model year, you, you, you it takes a few hours on the water to get it tuned up. Right. Right. For sure. And just in dialing in your jack plate and, and having everything set to where you want it. Um, so totally experience is a, is a big part of that. Um, let's roll into some of the stats, just the general, um, you know, stats that you guys have on, on the, on the boat itself on your website here. So, um, I think a big, a big question, right. For everyone, it's very similar to the, um, electric vehicle market that we're in right now. And, and that turning, so a range of, of 200 miles, um, you know, that's on any freshwater Lake, that's pretty effective. What I, I would assume, right. That's not full throttle open, uh, on the, on the outboard or the, not the outboard in this case, but the, the, yeah. the rear motor, um, what, it, what's, I guess, uh, can you speak to that range a little bit? Yeah, so I think probably the best way to try and answer that is how we designed it and set it up to be uh, structured for range. And so I think, um, and this is always about compromises, right? There's compromises between range, between speed. Um, most of that's also driven by weight um, uh, and electric boat sort of performance. And so for us, what we tried to do was set it up so that um, on any given sort of tournament day, um, I think most anglers think they run at full throttle a lot, um, but they don't really. Um, uh, and so as we sort of looked at it and, and did some research with, with the Naval Architects at Oceans 5, um, what we sort of got to is sort of the sweet spot, at least for us as a target, which is two hours of wide open throttle um, going as fast as you, as you can um, and 10 hours of trolling motor um, uh, is basically what the boat and the battery system at, a, at 100 kilowatt hours is sort of set up to try and achieve. And so that becomes a pretty good compromise of, of, of performance. Um, the other end of that spectrum is if you just use the trolling motor and don't run the boat at high end speed, you've got like 48 hours of trolling motor you got like two days nice. <laughs> right like because it's such a big battery compared to the trolling even motor. the lithium batteries in the boats uh uh that we all run today um you've got days of of trolling motor capacity so it's really the high speed running runs that that um take most of the battery uh uh capacity and and performance right and that makes sense and and so when you it sounds like all the batteries are, like you said, strategically positioned in the bottom of the hole to have the weight where you want it. Yep. And are they, are they lithium batteries like everything else at this point? 
Yeah, yeah. So the, the best way to think about it, and, and they're not this, but the best way to sort of think about it is, um, so the walkway down the middle from the bow to the stern, there's sort of a walkway between the two sort of cockpits. Yeah, right. you sort of see it there. Um, the batteries are in there um, okay. and, they're, and they're stacked, you know, as low uh, to the V of the hull uh, as we can uh, get them. Um, mm -hmm. And and the best way to think about them is they're kind of like Tesla car batteries um, is, is the style of batteries uh, that okay. they are. And they're slotted in. There's a whole series of them slotted in down that walkway um, uh, down the down the middle. So the weight is is centered in the boat, um, and and uh, they're sort of slotted in there. Over time, like the, one of one of the ideas that we had um, as we were sort of brainstorming about this is ultimately we want to be able to get it to a place where the batteries are literally like briefcases where you can sort of take them out and charge them sort of one at a time and replace them. Um, it won't be like that uh, uh, for the initial sort of run of boats, um, uh, but eventually we would love to get to that state so that you could, in theory, have batteries on charge at home or in your truck, um, and then you know slot them in and, and go right back out on the water if you ever felt like you, you needed more uh, capacity. But um, that's sort of the setup and location of the batteries in the boat. Right. Okay. And and how many batteries? Like when you're saying that slotted concept, it doesn't sound like that's quite there yet, but yeah. you know, is the entire, is it 10, 15 batteries that are, that are spaced in there? Or is it just kind of, how's that layered through in between right I now? I think we have, uh, doing this off, off the top of my head right now, I don't have it in front of me, but I think we have like 24 battery packs all connected together. It's really like the best way to think about it is it's one big battery. Um, mm -hmm. cause you can't actually replace the, or you, you can, but like, we'd only do that like you know at a dealer for service, so to speak. If a cell went bad, um, it's sort of like twenty-four supercells is the way to think about it. Got it. But it's one big pack, um, essentially. Okay, gotcha. No, uh, I think the only the only you know range I think it is a it's I mean for 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 tournament anglers and kind of what what we do from the tournament side of things, I think that electric, it, I've, I've always had hesitancy on both electric vehicles, trucks, as well as boats because of the range. And it's thinking like, okay, you know, for instance, I'm driving to California, that's going to be a 17 hour trip, right? You know, pulling a boat, like that's just, it's yeah. just, uh, the, the technology isn't there yet, but it seems ranges are getting further and further and i'd imagine that's the same way in the in the boat world of things yeah yeah i think it's expanding every few months every few weeks you know the, the people we've been talking to about the battery system for the boat um come up with a new innovation and a new idea um and the sort of this the sort of tipping point between like bleeding edge and cutting edge and mainstream right and we we don't we don't want to be at the bleeding edge of this where no. it breaks down it doesn't work and we thought it was a good idea but it doesn't work we sort of want to be more at that cutting edge tried and tested we know it works we know it's got this range we know we're going to get home safely um and, and i think one of the things we built into the boat is it's got its own sort of software built in uh to the to the boat um and so it has like both sort of apple carplay and android auto type Okay. Uh, software so you can connect all your phone and apps and, and and stuff in it but it has its own yeah this is a great example where when you launch the boat at the ramp it automatically knows with your gps exactly where you are and then it basically tracks you around the lake um and always is telling you uh when and basically it's time to turn home based on your battery range right um so it's sort of constantly giving you range anxiety uh, relief um, and telling you how far um, and how much battery it will take and at what speed and performance um, it'll go. And it's also got a safety net built in. Um, so it's got about a 10% buffer built in um, uh, on your range as well. So, Got it. Okay. And now speaking to the um, electronics and the screen here. So it looks like I mean, we've got a screen at the at the console, both the the driver's seat as well as the 
second passenger console. And then um, additionally, it looks like in this case, anyway, it's got Garmin trolling motor, Garmin uh, graphs up front. So uh, that initial one, that, that big one at the console, is that a Garmin unit or is that your guys' own unit? What's the, what's the current situation there? Um, yeah, I believe that it is a Garmin unit in the photos. Yes. Um, and that right now is what's going to come on the boat. Okay. So all six, like all six of the screens, um, are Garmin, Garmin screens. Mm -hmm. Um, and all six of them, uh, we're planning to ship with the boat, uh, so, so to speak. So it's sort of a, a Garmin package, uh, out of, out of the gate. Um, right. we know that that will mean some people want to switch and stuff like that. And we, we're happy to have those conversations if people want to switch to Hummingbird or Lawrence or whatever. You can still um, add that onto your boat. Yeah. Right. Um, but right. like, this is, this is sort of the setup that we're, um, we're offering sort of right out of the gate. And uh, we think it, it so sort of the width at the bow um, mm -hmm. gives you this, the space to be able to incorporate four screens. And I think there's two things about that, like as we talked about it. One is you can never have enough width on the bow of a bass boat. <laughs> like um, <laughs> you just can't. And so like we wanted it to be as wide as humanly possible, both so we could have more screens and, and so the screens weren't like stacked, stacked. up like right. in a crazy way, but like actually seemed like they were actually designed and built for, the, for, the, for their placement. Um, and then two, like, you know, we wanted, by the time you add three or four or five rods on each side with a strap, all of a sudden you've restricted your space to fish to like really one person. Um, and so we were like, let's make this as wide as we possibly can. Um, and so then we were like, well, the, so the towing road rules in 50 States means that, you know, 102 inches is as wide as you can make it. Right. And with we, the trailer, with a trailer. And we were like, yeah, we don't, we don't want that. That's like a false sort of restriction. Like right. there's gotta be, a, there's gotta be a better way to do that. And I think that's honestly what's stopped boats, bass boats being bigger than they are length and width wise it makes um, sense yeah. they sort of need to be proportional mm -hmm. and so um as we sort of got into it we were like um again we sort of tapped into the sort of the offshore powerboat racing world um and so uh we're working with a trailer boat company that that makes the trailers for those offshore powerboats and essentially what it does is is it it tilts the boat um, and turns it when it's on the trailer for towing through hydraulics to make it inside less than 102 inches. It's right, right around 100 inches when it's in the trailer for towing. Um, then you push a button and it goes into the launch mode at the ramp and it's completely flat again. Um, and you can launch it at the ramp and you've got 107 inches basically at the bow uh, for fishing. I, I think I know exactly what you're talking about here. And I think I just pulled it up on Google for those of you on YouTube to see, but, uh, yeah, Myco, Myco, M Y C O is the trailer company that, that makes most of these. Okay. Trailers. Um, but, but anyway, um, yeah, basically it tilts the boat. I mean, it's, it's so you yeah, can have not, it not I mean, quite as extreme as that, but yes, exactly. <laughs> that, exactly. That same concept. Some of these are completely sideways, but yeah, um, it's, not, it's not like that. Okay. Ours gotcha. looks, this sounds embarrassing, but, but ours looks like it's your first time putting your boat on the trailer and you've had a few too many beers. Messed up. Um, it's sort of like on a slight slant like that, kind of. Um, right. But it really makes a huge difference, right? Because it takes that length and width constraint sort of away and lets us have like a, a much bigger, more stable platform to fish off of. Um, and so we just thought that was worth for a relatively small cost in the trailer uh, capability it gives you unbelievably more space for fishing like um it's like all boats a, a, a foot longer and a, a foot wider makes a massive massive difference uh, right well and and that comes into a good i mean uh i guess the 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 negative side to that like you said um you can't really have it all with things um i i've always been a narrow a narrow boat 
guy. And the reason I, mean, I can't, uh, my first bass boat was an 18 and a half foot legend bass boat, super narrow hole, but I loved it because it had it such a good ride in rough water. Um, horrible to team fish off of. Right. I mean, I, I back to your point earlier, Colby, like I team fish a lot. Um, but both of us like to be on the front deck looking at the graphs right on the trolling motor and we step over each other. And when we have 20 rods out, which normally ends up being the case, it's just a mess. But so, so I absolutely see a massive benefit. The negative though, I see is in at least our Western lakes and then on lakes with a lot of docks. Right. Um, I like to go in and out of stuff and be, you know, into a, into a little spot in between two docks. You know what I mean? So you probably lose a little bit of that, right. Having a nine foot wide, uh, you know, um, with on the on the bass boat you're gonna lose a little bit of it but not to, or at least in georgia not to the point to where you can't dock fish at all like uh, mm-hmm. dock fishing is still 100 percent possible and like you can you it's all really about how you position your boat like sure. whether you're going uh with the wind into the wind because and that obviously helps you or hurts you getting into your positions for in between these docks and stuff. And so um, getting in between won't be impossible, but it will be more difficult. Yes. Sure. I I think it's been, it's interesting. Like I think there's two things that have fundamentally changed how you fish off, off this boat versus other bass boats. So one is um, if you, if you're, if you're on a windy day and you want to, you want to fish you put spot lock on whether you're in shallow or deep water it, you're sort of facing into the wind and then you're going to like cast into the wind or sort of 90 degrees to the wind um and it's kind of a pain on on, on this you do the same thing but then you go to the back of the boat and fish directly downwind and make casts that you know make you look like you're teeing off at in denver right <laughs> um, right like the, the unbelievable and so like it changes how you set up the boat when you can fish anywhere off the boat right um mm-hmm. and so whether you put it on an angle on the corner or you put the bow in or the stern in everything's an option um here but yeah it's wider uh for sure than certainly a, a legend um would be to sort of squeeze in between spots um but like of all the compromises, we felt like this was the one we we actually wanted wider, uh, so to speak. And 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 again, we sort of copied off the the wakeboarding boats, right? You think about the big mm-hmm. Malibus and Mastercrafts and stuff. Um, it's still got like your traditional bow entry, um, but uh, it's got that pickle fork kind of bow that gives you as much width, sort of At the front, uh, yeah. On the front and then the other thing that we did, and these are all like small things that, you know, some people won't notice and won't care about. Others really will. But like, we also bought the waterline of the bow as far forward as we possibly could. Um, so it doesn't have like a, like a sort of, like a legend has like this really like pointy bow, right? Sure. Like it doesn't actually go into the water where you stand and cast from. You're standing in the air, basically. Right, right. <laughs> off the tip there. Uh-huh. Yeah, in, in, in the in the Lurian, you're actually standing like right where the bow goes into the water, mm. which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's a really big deal for stability, and it's a really big deal when your trolling motor is set up right in front of that entry point um, mm-hmm. for maneuverability. So even though it's a twenty-three foot, almost twenty-three feet long, yeah, it, it's. It's maneuverability under the trolling motor feels like a, like a 17 or 18 foot boat because it's directly lined up uh, with with the uh, hull of the boat. Yeah, and that's uh, that's another interesting. I, I like that thought process on the on the design. As far as I've always kind of taken myself out of the bass fishing world. I think when people see bass boats, I think they're confused how the trolling motor always leans one direction right it's going on the side of the hole on the gunnel of the Mm -hmm. boat and so i've always thought that that's kind of a uh an interesting um design look because it's just it's not symmetrical right it's not even it just looks kind of kind of goofy being on one side yeah but like like we said earlier like we're not we're not here to criticize we just think uh there's little things like that 
a lot of thought and curation and and you know uh trial and error has gone into it um uh and so yeah we're excited to to get it out there and, and get more people using it <laughs> yeah now what do you think I, just thinking through um business in general and, and something like this this is going to yeah. be you know who who is your buyer who is your avatar um, that you're you're going after with with this this design. I mean, obviously at a price point, right? You're you're kind of very much. Yep. You're not too far off of a Vexus fully loaded. You're not too far off of a Basscat Jaguar that's a 22, 23 foot boat. But you're at one hundred and eighty five thousand. I think is what I what I saw. I mean, yeah. who's who's your target audience in in this situation? Yeah, it's a really really good question. So I think um, look a couple of things on. It. I think you know clearly it is expensive. There's no way we're not hiding that or um, pretending that it isn't. It, this is a, you know, this is the top end of, of the market um, right. in terms of, of price point. Um, I think a couple of things around that is, you know, if you start adding up the sort of the components that you see on the boat, uh, six on, graphs, on the website, <laughs> six graphs, for example, um, <laughs> and all the top of the line ones, not like the small size ones. Um, and sort of fit and finish and and everything else, um, it's it's actually not as as expensive as as you might think. Uh, I think the second part is is really comes down to um, some things on a longer term basis, right? If if you think about owning a boat for five, six, seven, ten years, um, not having to do it, you know, thousand dollar oil change every year uh, or right. more, uh, you don't have to do that. It's basically you know. Is sort of a ten-year, um, what I would call drivetrain maintenance cycle. Wow! Um, and so, look, having owned multiple boats and still owning multiple boats, like um, there's no such thing as a zero maintenance boat. Period. Yeah. <laughs> I don't hear what anybody it's, says. It's like, the worst. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, so it's not like it's zero maintenance, but but the big expensive, con repetitive maintenance is as reduced as it can possibly be. So you start thinking about that on a seven, 10 year time horizon, it, it gets pretty competitive, I think, uh, price sure. wise. Point. Yeah. And, and then look, just honestly, the price of batteries is pretty much the same as the price, if not higher than the price of a new outboard. Yes. Right. Like that's know. really where all the money goes on this boat is in the, in the batteries and batteries are basically like that, like a, like an outboard. Um, and so I think, also, the way to think about that is, you know, as you look at repowering your boat, um, you know, at some point, these are electric batteries, you know, in 10, 10 plus years, um, you'll have to repower the battery packs, essentially, and put new battery packs uh, uh, in the boat. Um, but um, that's that's sort of the primary drivers of the cost and expense. Um, right. And, you know, I would say, like... Um, we, we weren't hundred percent sure who the buyer was, would, would be. Um, yeah. and I think just a, a quick story on that, like last Wednesday, we were planning to launch this week. Um, yeah. last Wednesday, uh, uh, end of February, we, um, put the website up just to make sure it was working and everything else. And we have just been like overwhelmed. <laughs> it's been bombarded kind of in terms of the interest and traffic and, and even orders we've gotten so far from all kinds of different people. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been amazing. The, the response. And, um, so, you know, it, it's also been interesting. I think there's a big Delta and age group response, right? Mm. Like people between Colby's age and my age, like a super jazzed about this, um, yeah. people, my age and older, <laughs> things don't like change quite as much let's just say i was gonna, oh. I was gonna say that's the, like the <laughs> not 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 gonna knock on any generation but no no you but, know there's yeah there's always gonna be people who are gonna oppose change right like that's just the yeah. nature of, of anything i think you said this earlier in the in the show like um yeah you know, we are not trying to like you know sh do anything to show anybody up quite the opposite we um, we would love to move the industry forward and 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 have more people out there fishing, catching more fish, right? Um, so. 
Awesome. Awesome. No, I, I super good point. I think too, just on the, on the maintenance side. Um, I I've been thinking about that a lot lately, just with all these, all these, um, car repair shops. Right. And if, if a major component of that is all oil and gasoline motors and spark plug changes and oil change, you know, just all that. And that all goes away. I mean, that's gotta be 60 70 percent of car maintenance right now you're just dealing with tires and obviously electric motors uh and, and issues there but just the it's it's crazy to me yeah. to think through that that that's gonna it's kind of um if you know if we're going this direction it's it's gonna reduce a lot of the maintenance which is a, i think a huge uh, a huge benefit because right now i'm trying to get a oil change and all kinds of stuff ready before a tournament and it's you know that's not necessarily an issue within a, an electric yeah, I mean, it's, but I think it's one of those things where like this is happening today, just not on the same size batteries as we're talking about today, right? So like every bass fisherman is becoming a battery expert. Um, <laughs> they just are. Like you have to be right. if you if you're serious about it. You sort of have to be. If you're running more than two screens, you have to be. If you're trying to do like Ford Live Sonar. Um, the quality of current to your transducer and to your display is kind of everything um, in terms of the resolution of, of the live, uh, you know, image that you actually get back. Right. And so like, I actually think what's, what's actually going to happen. And we've been talking to a number of dealers about this is um, I think the dealers are going to change from sort of oil and, and, and sort of uh, oil changes and, and, outboard repair, not short term, but long, long term to really being about, um, you know, setting up and configuring electronics, chart plotters, transducers, the things that are like sort of very clearly tied to catching fish um, right. as opposed to like mechanical maintenance type tasks. And, and I think and that's I, already I, happening, but I'll, I'll pay a lot and I already pay a lot <laughs> to people <laughs> to help catch more fish. I don't want to pay that much for people to help make the mechanical stuff work. Right. But like, if I can catch more fish, like I'm in, like, um, if it, if it really works. Right. So. Right. No. And, and that just, I mean, that's a good point with, with two of our partners with the show. I mean, our title sponsor being X2 power. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, the, the battery side of things. I just have so many, so many conversations with our, with our folks over there just around, every aspect. I mean, my boat right now, my Phoenix has got, we're in the process of, of doing it all. So we'll have three lithium 12 volt batteries on the trolling motor, an additional lithium just to run the four graphs and then a cranking battery as well, a GM cranking battery. So it's, I mean, all that to fit into the back of a boat is, is already a stretch of things. And, and, uh, you know, and, and you're dead on, I mean, like bass fishing electronics with, with us, it's the same deal. I mean, that business is founded on selling electronics as well as installing electronics correctly. Because right now, and I think it's changing, I do, but you see all these um, electronic dealers that specialize also in installs because from the factory, from the factory or from a traditional dealer that deals with maybe pontoon boats and pleasure boats and bass boats, they don't really know what they're doing when it comes to adding four graphs and, and, this much power and, you know, not the right wiring. And, and there's so much that goes into it. So I, I agree to that standpoint. I think that you're going to see more and more folks focused on the electrical side, which in turn is already, it's going to tie in well to what you guys are trying to do. Yeah, we hope, we hope so, but uh, you know, it's, it's still early days and, and look, we're open to feedback and, uh, and are getting a lot of it right now. Um, good, bad, and otherwise. And so, uh, I would say mostly positive though. It's been like the response has been amazing, uh, so far. So yeah, we're pretty fired up. Awesome. Date wise. Um, you know, when, when will these start rolling, rolling out, um, test drives, you guys plan at being at shows. What's, what's kind of the timeline at this point being that we're early into 2023 here. Yeah, so we're 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 shooting for like sort of the end, next year's boat show circuit, so to speak. Okay. So sort of call it October of this year through this time next year, sort of the winter um, boat show season or the boat show circuit, and then uh, 
probably culminating at, at the 2024 Bassmaster Classic. So oh, cool. It's sort of going to be a big event, I think, for us. Just um, got announced in, in Grand, uh, Grand Lake, Oklahoma. So cool. Yeah. And then um, uh, probably later that, that same summer of 24 um, is when deliveries will start. Uh, okay. Off here. So that's, that's the goal, uh, at least. Um, I will say that this is pretty complicated and pretty hard. And so um, <laughs> some of these timelines are, are open, subject to change, let's say. But, right. Um, but that's, that's the intention from a timeline point of view. No, and, and I think what's cool too on, on the website, you know, I, I think you guys have pre-orders and, or, you know, yeah. basically you've got a reserve yours now for just a $500 fee. So um, that's, I think that, you know, there's, there's been, and, and honestly, there's been conversations just around boats, uh, in the industry and, and brands that, you know, have been some shady stuff that has occurred where they've taken a deposit and not given it back. But it, I like how in this case, I mean, we're talking about a $500 fee on an $185,000 boat. That's not super yeah. exuberant to where if you guys, you know, or, Hey, this is an extra year out kind of a thing or whatever, whatever it takes. It's not a, a gouge in, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. I think the other thing to call out on that is it is refundable. Uh, so it's all being held in escrows. Uh, so if, if um, nice. for whatever reason, the company goes out of business or whatever, um, uh, anyone who's made a deposit will get their money back uh, uh, here. So it's sort of a, a low to no risk uh, sort of uh, thing. So if people are interested and, and want to, <laughs> want to follow along. Um, yeah. Like put, put a pre-order in. Um, it certainly helps us and, and helps, uh, us, you know, as we talk to the bank about, you know, uh, production and everything else to, um, to, to make this all happen. So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. I've got one last question for you guys and then I'll let you go. But, uh, something that, that I just, uh, just thought about here is, okay. So we're seeing right now, just in the, in the bass boat market, you know, 2022, uh, 2021, I mean, just an explosion of boat values, right? It's very hard for folks to go get boats and, um, uh, production had issues and therefore then used boat prices went up and it was just a, a, a really hot market in the bass boat market. And then, um, you know, recession and potential and interest rates increase, you know, why, why now, um, do you guys feel like it's the, it's the time to move on this? Obviously it's been in the works for, for some time, but what's, uh, what's your thoughts on the timing, uh, with, with Lurion? Yeah. So look, I think, um, there's never a good time to, uh, start a boat <laughs> company. Um, that's what I would say. Uh, it's, you know, every financial advisor I have says this is a terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I think, I think, and they all say the timing is terrible as another reason not, not to do it. Yeah. I think as, as we've talked about it, like um, it really just comes back to the original sort of vision that, that Colby had is, um, you know, we want to catch more fish. Um, we want to help people have more fun on the water. Um, and both in, in two, two person tournaments and four person families. Um, right. And, and we just think it like it sort of changes the 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 dynamic, so to speak. And so, um, you know, we felt it was worth you know launching and trying to make this this become a reality uh, now. And so that we're all in um, and trying to make that make that happen. Um, and based on the support we've gotten so far, I think our timing is actually pretty good. Like, um, and so uh, mm. it's been kind of overwhelming. Like, we can't even respond to all the Facebook comments and instagram and like the social media is like you know no i don't know what we're going to do about it <laughs> uh it's, it's like off the charts so uh yeah i think we feel pretty good about the timing but um yeah look it's an expensive an expensive uh craft um and it's gonna take a little bit of time to deliver it but um based on the on the input so far we're fired up awesome Awesome. Well, guys, I think that's a great way to end things. 
I look forward to uh, following along with your guys' journey and everything. And we'll have to have you back on, you know, six months, a year from now and, and see where things are at and, uh, and, and keep it, keep it going. It's awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Really appreciate it. Absolutely guys. Have a good rest of your night. Thanks. You too. Bye. <laughs>